for um, spending some time with us today. We are gonna talk about emerging expectations for Mental Health Council Corporation. Um, this is a panel presentation that is being co-sponsored by KCREP and by OMCA. So we thank those organizations for providing us this space to engage in some important discussion. Um, let us do a couple quick introductions and uh, we'll jump right in. So I'm Amy Milsom. I am currently um, a professor and department chair at Appalachian State University. Um, and I'm serving as the chair of the KCREP board of directors. So uh, I will be one of your facilitators today. And I'm Aaron Norton, I'll be a co-facilitator. I am the uh, Southern Regional Director at the American Mental Health Counselors Association. Do some work in my private practice and integrity counseling, a little teaching at the University of South Florida and some work for the National Board of Forensic Evaluators. All right, and if we could advance to the next slide. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has qualitatively changed the delivery of counseling services to meet the mental health needs of our clients. And as is so often the case during times of hardship and crisis, uh, the public has experienced a heightened awareness of mental health. And so we've had to rise to meet the demand, providing counseling services in a safe and very different manner than many of us are accustomed to, um, so that we can safely provide services to our clients. I know in some nationwide research, we've seen that depending on the state before the pandemic, only five to 30% of counselors provided telehealth. Now it's 95, 96% of counselors across the country. So we've certainly had to endure some changes. In this webinar, a panel of presenters will share the changing realities of preparing new professionals for entry into the mental health counseling field. So we have a couple um, specific objectives for this. Uh, the first thing we're gonna ask our panelists to talk about is some of the challenges that they uh, that are faced by counselor education programs and interns in completing the clinical field experience um, components of the programs and to talk about strategies that, that they've successfully able, been able to implement to address those. Um, we're also gonna ask them to talk about challenges faced by the clinical placement sites in terms of meeting the needs of interns and again, struggles and, and ways that they've addressed those concerns. And then finally, we're gonna you know, try to, to just brainstorm and talk through some implications for the future of mental health counselor preparation and practice. Um, so we will do that in a, in a fairly structured way. Our goal today is to walk through each of these um, objectives in, in the form of a specific question. Um, we will be um, providing some time at the end of this uh, panel presentation for questions. So what we were hoping that you all could do, um, I think you know at the moment you all should be muted. And so we're gonna ask that you keep yourself muted throughout the presentation. Um, we are happy to have you post questions in the chat box if you're comfortable that way. And we will save those to the end and, and answer those at that time. We also can have some open, um, if you'd rather speak your question out loud at the end, uh, I think, and I'll kind of revisit at the time, we'll ask you to raise your virtual hand if possible and we can call on you just to kind of keep some structure. There's a lot of people on this presentation. It looks like 72 of us right now. So um, it'll be important that we try to maintain um, some, some semblance of order in the way that we get people to voice their concerns. Um, but anyway, so we will easily have 15 minutes or more at the end to, to have some open discussion with you all. Um, we are recording this presentation uh, and both KCREP and AMCA will in some form post that presentation on their website uh, or disseminate it in some way at the end of this time. So if you know other people who couldn't attend or you wanna share this out afterwards, uh, you certainly can feel free. So with all that, uh, let me turn over to um, have our panelists introduce themselves. We tried to have a diverse group uh, representing different kind of roles. And so we're gonna start with Ksenia who represents our student intern voice. Hi, hello everyone. Um, my name is Ksenia Kogan. I recently just finished a clinical mental health counseling program, master's degree in Southern New Hampshire University. And I just recently finished my internship program uh, so I'm, uh, I would be uh, uh, happy to share my experience here. Thank you. And then we'll move to Karen. Good morning. I'm Karen Langer. I'm the Counseling Center Director for City University of Seattle. So I'm out on the West Coast. And um, I've been there for 23 years now, um, working with interns and practicum students. In, their in a training clinic. And I'm also the Western Region Director for AMCA and a 
former AMCA president. Thank you, Karen. And we'll move to Heather. Good morning. I think it's morning for most everybody who's here. <laughs> Um, my name is Heather Paisler Chesterton, and I serve as both a faculty and the director for the practicum and internship experiences at the master's level um, at the University of the Cumberlands, which is out of Kentucky. Um, our program is uh, primarily in the digital space, so I'm joining you from Western New York, and I look forward to speaking with you a little bit more this morning. Thank you. Thank you. And then finally, Christy. Hi, I'm Christy rogers Lark. I'm the Clinical Director for Outside the Box Therapy, which is a small rural practice in um, South Carolina. I also work um, as a research professor at Erskine Theological Seminary, where I um, help run the Masters of Christian Counseling program there. Thank you. So I know I'm looking forward to, to hearing what they have to say. I, I am going to hear it for the first time as, as with all of you. So I think we'll have some really good discussion and hopefully some helpful information for everyone. Um, we're going to jump in then with our first question. And what we've asked is that the panelists each take about five minutes to try to share what they feel is maybe some of the most important um, content. And so the first thing um, we're going to look at is in relation to the experiences and opportunities that counseling interns have during their field placement or their clinical internship, um, what are some of the most significant changes that have occurred as a result of COVID, uh, specifically in relation to safety, technology-mediated service delivery, and supervision? And, and you can see here, I'll read these sub-questions. We ask them to consider in case you're not visually on your screen, what are some of the safety protocols and, and how did they change? Um, what activities and modalities of direct service are used or acceptable and how did they change? And then finally, what does supervision look like and how is it conducted and or how did it change? So we've asked the panelists to speak to whatever, whatever components of this they felt comfortable. We're gonna start with uh, Karen. Good morning. Um, in thinking about this first talking point, I kind of reflected a year ago when we had we were work, I was working with about 15 practicum students. And one day we hear we're shutting down. And we had always done face-to-face -face only uh, counseling experiences. And all of a sudden we were looking at how do we keep the students safe? How do we keep the clients safe? And we couldn't do that in our uh, normal uh, setting. So we had to shift pretty quickly and having to look at, okay, how do we work with, how do we get the students their experience? And then how do we also um, work with clients? So you're looking at two different sides of it. Prior to going online or having to shut down, I was always within about 10 feet of the students. So when they were working in the room, they were video recording. And also at the same time, they could step out and come get me. When we had to move to an online kind of format or something remote, I wasn't physically there anymore. And so that created a really interesting safety issue, not just for the students, but also for the clients. What happens when your client has some suicidal ideation, but your supervisor is on a computer somewhere else. So that, that was probably the biggest challenge for us. Um, and we made the decision that with practicum students, because a lot of them had no clinical experience, that it just wasn't safe for anybody to be working with um, our normal clients. Our, no, our typical clients were from the community and they're typically uh, lower income, uninsured, marginalized groups. And so they were a little bit more vulnerable and we didn't want to continue taking those in when we had students who had no experience and had no support. So that was kind of a, an interesting challenge. Uh, so that so we, we had to, to relook at that and I'll talk to that a little bit later, what we decided to do. Um, on the other hand, in some ways, supervision 
uh, became easier uh, because other modalities, the students were recording every single session. They co could, we use Teams for supervision and they could chat with me at any time. It's on my phone, it's on my computer. Um, they're in many, many ways, they're um, more open to talking because they're not sitting right in front of you and nervous. So they've got a little bit of a barrier there. So that, that, that barrier that we talk, talk about potential when you're online because you're not physically in the room with them, with supervision in some ways was a, was a opportunity. On the other hand, it's also, um, there's some challenges with um, keeping the students accountable because they're not sitting there and you can't like, um, can't do things like that because you have to schedule time with them and they don't always answer and those types of things. Um, trying to think what else. Um, I do think that I have a little bit less time with the students because they can't in many ways, just bring me into their session or they um, ask a question as soon as they're out of their session because I may or may not be available. Whereas before they could just walk in my office and sit down and say, hey, I wanna talk about this. So I guess the, the biggest challenge was really the, the not being available in the same sense. So I think I'll leave it there for now. Okay, thank you. I mean, it sounds like you're saying that availability, you know, led you to have to think about screening clients in, in different ways of who would even be appropriate for these students to work with because you weren't available in the same way. Um, but yeah, I also heard absolutely. you, yeah, I also heard you saying that, that in some ways those supervision might have been, the students might have been more open or more vulnerable because that safety factor, right? Not having to sit in the room and face you. Um, so it'll be interesting to hear you talk more about that later, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. And and it was definitely caused us to be creative. I think that that's a key word for everybody now, which hopefully is a good thing, but yes. Um, Christy, what would you like to share about this one? Well, thankfully for us personally at Outside of the Box, it didn't change a whole lot because we never actually went completely virtual. Um, part of that is the world nature that we had. Our numbers were very, very low. Um, and we spent a lot of time monitoring the situation and looking at safety. Um, and, and plus we work from room to tomb and we work with children and every flu season, we always up the cleaning protocols and things like that because none of us want to get the flu. So we all sort of looked at this sort of the same way. We lifted out some policies that would impact people as far as no shows or things like that. If you sick, stay home, those type of things. Um, so a lot of this, a lot of our policies didn't actually change because of our rural area. Now, what has changed for me with interns is now I have more access to interns. I'm not competing with everybody because um, we were one of the few that actually stayed home. The other thing that um, we had to take into consideration when we looked at how we were going to implement service delivery was the community that we're serving. So we also work with marginalized, lower socioeconomic, a, a good portion of our clientele is Medicaid, Medicare, those type of populations that don't have access to technology. In fact, when the schools were looking at going to go online full time, that was definitely a barrier there because you only had about 60% who had internet access um, abilities. So as a group, we met together to determine what was going to be best for our clients. And, and all of us felt very passionate that we could not stop serving, but we were going to go based on the comfort of the clients that we serve. So we stepped up our cleaning protocols. We gave both clients and ourselves a mask. If they wanted us to wear a mask, we'd wear a mask. If they want to wear a mask, they'd wear a mask. Um, all of those things 
all of those things change based on it. We did offer telehealth prior to COVID. The only difference is post COVID is now it is more accessible to people than it, it wasn't prior. I mean, we couldn't get telehealth coverage prior for some of those low socioeconomic. So now we have people who are coming forward that may not historically have come forward who now are willing to see telehealth options. However, um, we only have maybe less than 5% of our clients who will actually choose the telehealth option. They, to this day, they continue to prefer to come into the center. Um, we've tried to stagger appointments. Not all of the therapists are there at all time. There are five of us. Um, and so we try to stagger. So I'll work some weekends. Some people will work during the day. The other big change that we saw is as far as the training capabilities, there is a lot of training that um, both students as well as existing therapists wanted to have access to that were prohibited because of the cost of the training, plus hotels, plus travel, plus everything else. And suddenly everything went online. So everybody was jumping on those training opportunities that they have postponed because of cost factors. So all of those things were pretty good. As far as what supervision looked like, I think the only thing that changed on us is I did move my supervision you know, online. And, and like was said before, we are able to get better access as far as if they are in an online session, I can actually go and sit in on an online session with them, which allows me to see them you know, more practically than I would have otherwise. Um, but that, that's been about it. Ours, ours has been, knock on wood, has been fairly consistent in, in practice. And, and I will say on that note, we did get a lot of flack for that because everybody was going online and flattening the curve. And, and we spent so much time working with the, the community leaders in that area to find out if this was something that we had to do. And it was just a uniform decision for us where we were located that it was okay. So. I guess that's it. Thank you. Yeah, well, it sounds like in some ways you didn't have to deal with some of the, the technology specific challenges that others did, but. Well, it is hard when you're a small rural practice, you don't have thousands of dollars for upgrading technology. Um, we had already been working with technology to make sure we were in compliance with high tech HIPAA, but as far as space and access and the other things that are good for great service was we were very limited on. And we remain limited on. Um, but yeah, that, in, in that sense, we were already tracking that way anyway. So it hasn't been that much of a disruptive knock on wood to us. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and probably fortunate that there were some graduate students who were still able to get you know, the face-to-face -face experience. I know that's what well, we're going to hear from Cassinia in just a minute. You know, I know many of the students in, in my institution have you know, express concerns that I don't know how to do this face to face. I've never physically sat in the room with somebody and that's very different. So, um, so maybe we'll just shift to Cassinia now. You may talk about that or not, but um, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think that what Karen shared at the very beginning, I think I would stress out completely if without any clinical experiences, I would like go uh, and provide telehealth to the clients. That would be really stressful without supervisor and other therapists that you can uh, consult with and get some help and guidance. Uh, so um, uh, depending on the community that um, my site where I got practicum and internship provided, or well, this community required face-to-face uh, -face services. Uh, the first place where I had a practicum, this site provided uh, psych rehabilitation services uh, to the clients suffering with schizophrenia and schizo, uh, schizoaffective disorders. So they uh, came to the facility for the group sessions. Um, and uh, in terms of safety, uh, clients and therapists were wearing masks all the time and uh, had to measure the temperature and uh, uh, clients had to be split in groups. And as uh, we had some, um, I think like companies or services come to check uh, if, we, if we do have a, uh, uh, more clients that we can in one area. Um, and unfortunately, uh, due to COVID and uh, all the requirements, uh, this site was permanently closed uh, due to COVID and I had to find some other place. And another site where I had my internship, when I continued my internship, that was uh, a recovery and blocked in Florida, where I am. It is a, a substance abuse treatment facility. 
and also a client who are transfer transferred from detox uh, right to PHP program when I was having my internship. They also required this face-to-face -face, uh, services. Um, so these clients, as they leave uh, all together at the residence, they uh, got tested, but at the same time, we're all like wearing masks and uh, therapists and clients. Uh, but in, ter in terms of uh, supervision, what changed for me, I got with, I was without any supervisor for the first five weeks as my supervisor got, unfortunately, um, got sick with coronavirus when I got uh, to the practicum. And uh, I felt uh, I felt really lost for the first five, five weeks uh, because I didn't get any, uh, um, not the support, I got the support, a lot of support from other therapists, but you know, like guidance and more like help so that I could have my supervision hours with my supervisor. She was so sick that we even couldn't like chat and talk with her over the phone or have any telehealth because it took so long, like more than a uh, month uh, to get better. So I, I just did my best, best and asked uh, all the therapists in the facility for some guidance and help. So that was some changes in terms of supervision. Later, uh, we had the supervi supervision with uh, my um, supervisor in, in person and over the phone and through telehealth. Um, but there were some challenges definitely at the very beginning. Yeah, I mean, it just sounds like, you know, coming from a student perspective and maybe feeling a little bit anxious or insecure anyway, and then having the inconsistent, Absolutely. you know, planning to work with somebody and then they're out of commission, so to speak. And, and thankfully others happy to, to to step up and, and help, but I'm sure that's still just, you know, whatever you must have been feeling throughout that of, of you know, getting through it in some way. Um, not sure how we we address that, but I think it's important for people to, to maybe consider what, what students might be feeling in, in relation to all of the changes that are happening. So thank you for sharing that. Um, all right, and we're gonna wrap up this talking point with um, Heather. Thank you. Such such a rich question to try to address everything you want to within five minutes, but thankfully my colleagues have really shared a lot of, of great insights. So I'll try not to be redundant. Um, I think context is really important. So, you know, I first want to share that my program, I, we were already working in the digital space. So when everyone had to pivot a year ago from on ground to uh, the virtual uh, space that didn't, we didn't feel quite the impact there, but we certainly felt it um, uh, among our practicum and internship students in that arena, because m many of them, we have a national reach. Uh, students are, are responsible for the most part to secure their own sites. So they were within their own communities, uh, participating in their practicum and internship in person, going to their sites every day, practicing and hopefully advancing their basic basic counseling skills when suddenly they had to work from home in online or still continue to go to their sites, but work in front of a computer and, and, and work with their clients that way. Or, um, and, and those are for the, the fortunate students who were able to still go to their sites, whereas other sites completely shut down. Um, they lost their clients. Uh, students were released from their placements because agencies said, we just, we don't, we can't support students anymore in the face of this, this new, uh, big, mysterious, confusing um, and unpredictable virus that we're dealing with. Um, so, so we definitely felt it in, in that clinical space for certain. Um, two things that for or in my experience and what we what we certainly felt in terms of a priority and an impact within our program were around competence, competency and um, safety for sure, but um, not just client safety and the obvious protocols that we've already talked about and the fact that telehealth um, isn't for everybody, but we, we also felt it with our students and their safety, health and well-being. I mean, we were trying, we were... Um, managing students who came to us saying, you know, I'm immunocompromised. I don't feel safe going to my site for those whose sites remained open. And, and fortunately for us, it was few and far between, but we had to really um, take a really close look at some instances where students felt 
that they were feeling the pressure to still attend their sites and attend to their clients from an ethical perspective. But how do you reconcile that when they were feeling less protected at their sites in terms of safety protocols that weren't necessarily up to par or bolstered quite enough. I mean, it ranged from some students going to sites at minimum, you know, with a mask six feet from their clients to some of our students working in hospitals were attending in full PPE gear. And and, I mean, talk about the impact of that um, personal experience with your client uh, before you. Um, So, so, in addition to addressing the safety uh, component from f- from a client perspective with our sites, you know, what is your emergency protocol? How will you be available if our student is uh, seeing a client remotely? Who do they have access to should an emergency come up or some uh, need for risk assessment? We have that piece in addition to how are we supporting students who um, who are potentially jeopardizing their own health. So, so we created what we didn't have to do before uh, because we had, even though we train and teach remotely, our students were not doing their clinical experiences remotely. Um, So of course we had to allow for that, but make some provisions with the understanding that we're moving from um, what was once a niche to the norm now. Um, So uh, not only did we have to provide uh, a foundation for some uh, basic understanding, let alone some competency in delivering telemental health services, but reconciling that ethical component and not abandoning clients with how do we support our students in still working with their clients for those who are still attending in person um, while not risking their own health. So certainly we navigated that with some of our sites for students who, um, what we didn't want is for students to feel pressured to attend and participate in person if they felt it was compromised their own health. So we um, implemented uh, waivers, much like, you know, a nursing program, you have nurses who, when they do their clinicals, they're going into the hospitals and they're treating patients. Um, we had our students review and um, give permission and, and sign a waiver if they were willing to um, go to their sites. And if they weren't, that, and that could be rescinded at any time. Um, and even if they felt this isn't, uh, you know, I'm, I've, I'm immunocompromised, I'm not feeling that this is a safe situation for myself, we just have to do a lot of collaborating with, with our sites to implement some safety protocols to find creative ways to still support our student who's a developing clinician, but also from that humanitarian side, um, not putting them at risk from an institutional perspective. Mm-hmm. There's so much more that I will probably get to, but I'm watching the time. No, I appreciate that. And I think you bring up a really interesting point of, of the ethical dilemma. You know, it's like the fear that, that many of us have experienced, right? When you are exposed or think you're exposed and even as the vaccines are rolling out, you know, there's there's still a lot, but, you know, we're all trained to, to look out for our clients and, and sometimes that are to our own detriment. And so, you know, thinking about what that means for us at the university levels to be talking about with our students and, and again, what the sites need to understand um, those of you in practice to try to help navigate that, um, what is and is not possible. So yes, I'm sure we'll get more into that as we move over time, um, but we'll keep us rolling at least for now. So thank you, Heather. Um, I'm going to transition and I think I'll just read off this next talking point and then Aaron, I'm going to turn it over to you to, to navigate our panelists, if that's okay. Um, so picking up with, with what we just talked about then, um, we also wanted our panelists to talk about, you know, of the changes that, and the, and the things that they've just, um, talked through with us, what strategies they've been able to implement to kind of help navigate those. So, um, Aaron, I'll stop talking and turn it to you. All right. Yeah. I think, um, we will, uh, first go with Cassinia to talk to us some about, Um, the perspective of student interns, which I think is a great continuation from what Heather was just talking about from the perspective of the program, trying to link uh, student interns to services during a pandemic. Cassinia, um, what do you think your answer to this question would be? Uh, So I definitely would like to, uh, to relate what Heather shared before, because like university supervisor was really helpful and supportive and encouraging and that meant a lot for a lot of students so we appreciate it a lot um 
uh, on terms of uh, in terms of um, challenges. So uh, my college required uh, direct individual hours with client uh, starting from practicum. I know that a lot of colleges, even in Florida where I am, uh, required just uh, direct uh, hours and groups counts for that. So that was a big struggle and challenge for me because a lot of clients, um, they just switched to telehealth and uh, I struggled to get my individual hours, uh, direct hours with uh, individual clients. Uh, so that was a challenge for me. Um, and uh, also like what, um, what was also challenging, um, I asked, you know, it just shadowing a therapist that was allowed to shadow therapists and to do like co-counseling uh, with other therapists. But a lot of clients who come to the facility, they were stressed out to have some extra person in the office. So, so definitely a lot, a lot of uh, this changed uh, during pandemic time. And also uh, when having clients through telehealth, a lot of clients prefer to see their therapist without mask on and if uh, one of the uh, students are in the room, so therapists like required to wear masks. So there's been a lot of uh, like small challenges that uh, interfere with uh, requirements for the program and definitely adds to some stress that a lot of students and me particularly had during this time. Um, so what is the question? What strategies have you been able to implement? I think that the most helpful thing was to be as proactive as I could be. And I continue to ask every therapist in my facility if I can still uh, co-counsel them, if uh, their clients agree, if I would uh, would be in the room. And uh, um, so every, anything that I could do, I would just continue asking. And uh, the, another thing that helped me, those clients who came for the groups, uh, they were. Uh, I, I asked my therapist if I can get um, if I can get those clients for individual sessions. Although they came only for group uh, sessions, but that it helped me to get my hours. Um, so we just had to find some some new ways and uh, discuss it with therapists and supervisors. Supervisors. I think like being proactive uh, would be the the most helpful thing. And uh, I know that a lot of uh, university supervisors also. Uh, communicate with site supervisors and dis discuss these requirements and what can be done for the students to get their hours. So that was helpful. All right, thank you, Cassinia. And um, so now I'm kind of wondering, you've, you've shared some of the challenges from your perspective as a student intern and some of the strategies you use to try and overcome those barriers. I'm wondering, Christy, for you as a practitioner in the community, what you think some of the challenges have been and what strategies you've been able to implement. Probably one of the things that I, we have noticed overall is that we have this new landscape that was not necessarily available to us as private practitioners prior to COVID. So we were able to no pun intended, think outside of the box and service delivery and how we can most effectively serve clients. So we actually brought a lot of our student interns in that. So when they come in, when they come in because we have such a vast uh, population, um, like I said, we serve room to tomb and, and each therapist has their different specialty areas. We always make a point of asking students, what are the things that you want to learn? What are the ways that you would like to grow and then let us help facilitate that going forward. So if somebody came in and said, I wanted to work with adults, then we would say, well, what would you think about trying to offer a group online and see if you can get people to come in and, you know, and engage you that way. And so it has been a little bit of, of changing the way that we are um, providing service to those in the community and, and looping in the interns with it. One of the things that has been different is prior to COVID, I never worked with a student on how to do an effective online telehealth session. You know, it's more than just, to me personally, telehealth is actually more emotionally draining than it is to sit in front of somebody. And so to prepare students for that, I mean, I've, I've literally had a student finish a session in like 20 minutes and then I'm like, no, 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 you have to, you have to go longer. They were not prepared for that. So we have been, we've been teaching them how to adapt what they've learned in school to now let's try to do it in 
and, and look at this as a different modality, not necessarily great for everybody, but for those that it is, it can be highly effective. So getting them to engage, exploring different platforms from Zoom to Doxy to our own EHR and to see which one that they feel that they work well in. Um, so all of these things have changed post COVID and how we are offering services to those. And it's, it's actually been pretty good. We've had, a, we have a very bad habit at my center of taking interns and sort of throwing them in the deep end really quick, sink or swim. But, you know, and we still do that, but we also spend a lot, a lot of time preparing them before they get into working with some of our more difficult clients, especially online. They're very rarely alone with the client, even online. And our clients are very familiar that we are a teaching center and that it is possible that myself or the other person that does some supervision will be present in there. And I think that uniformity has been very helpful at getting a lot of our students to get in where they may not have prior. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so I, I like that you brought up um, the how fatiguing telehealth could be. Some people thought, well, that'll be easy. You don't even have to deal with the client being in the room. You just sit in front of a screen. My first full day of telehealth, I was exhausted and fatigued. <laughs> oddly had this paradoxical experience where by standing at a standing desk with my tele sessions, I actually got more energy. Um, it's, it's been an interesting learning curve for people figuring out what works for them. I'm wondering if we could now maybe hear a little bit from you, Heather, on what some of your thoughts are about strategies to some of those challenges for facilitating opportunities with student interns and the strategies that you've been using. Absolutely. Thank you. And yeah, the, the, the screen fatigue is real. Um, I hear my colleagues say, I'm so exhausted. I'm so, um, my, uh, you know, I'm more prone to migraines. You know, I have a really good friend who, who shared with me um, kind of a tip not too long ago, which I'm really grateful for is it was, she reminded me of, you know, being on screens, you're like, you're so focused and you're, you're putting so much energy into one of your senses. But a good reminder is to get up and stand, like Aaron said, and, and um, try to engage all the senses as much as you can. I mean, she gave me a great idea. She keeps a little slinky um, by her uh, computer. I do the same thing. I've got my essential oils so that I'm engaging all of my senses, which seems so simple that it's hard. It does feel like, you know, rocket science that, oh yeah, you know, the, I, I, why am I feeling so um, depleted in this one area? Well, it, it's very, it's a real thing. And if we can engage all those senses as best we can um, when we're in that virtual space with our clients, that can be helpful. I mean, I guess, I'm, you know, I work with children and adolescents doing play interventions. So that's probably that part of me that's coming out, but little, little uh, blurb on, on that for you. Hopefully that is helpful. Um, so going back to like the major challenge, I think for me, uh, being someone who um, is not just a clinician, but I'm primarily responsible for supporting the training and the skills acquisition of students during their experientials, is just a good reminder that what, what we do as people helpers hasn't changed, right? But the way we're doing it certainly has for all, if not most, um, and so just at the heart of that, okay, going back to competency, which I, I mentioned earlier, but didn't really take the opportunity to expand too much on, um, we're, we're doing more and more to train our clinicians and our students on how to do um, remote services and how to expand our reach, right? So that's the, the opportunity created in this challenge. But um, I think it was to, to Ksenia's point earlier, it's, you know, saying, gosh, if this would have happened when I was a practicum student, I just, I would freak out. I think you said your words were, um, and, and, and yet it did happen for thousands, right? They were just practicing their reflective skills and learning how to be present with their clients. And then suddenly they had to learn what we once considered a highly specialized area of expertise, telemental health. And now they were doing it all, all of that in that space. So we had to really pull from our resources, even those of us who are seasoned clinicians who weren't really working 
clinically in that digital space. We, we, you know, so many of us, you, you said earlier in the presentation, I believe, Erin, how, how many um, credentialed clinicians we have now in the area of telehealth. Um, you know, a year later, we have several on our faculty, but a year ago, we had to pull from the few that we knew on our faculty and say, okay, you're the expert, help us develop this training. We can send our students out, but we, it would be in poor form if we don't equip them. So we um, developed within our own internal resources, our own training, but the idea that we really had to um, emphasize is it's, this is not one and done. Um, this is not something that happens overnight. We're gonna give you a framework and a foundation for telehealth, but the expectation, the ethical mandate is that continued professional development. We'll give you, we'll provide you with some basic training and resources for a foundation of how to do telemental health. But look at how many um, training opportunities and webinars and articles came out this past year. So we were, as, as quickly as they were coming out, we were trying to disseminate that information to our students. And um, so once they, um, participated in an initial training for us and completed an attestation that went with that, it was the expectation that they would um, further their uh, skills and their competence by doing additional continuing ed hours. So the idea wasn't that, oh, you're done, you can check a box. It's not one and done. This is a highly specialized area that now has become integrated for trainees who are still lear learning and mastering um, their basic counseling skills. So um, we, we had to work very quickly um, internally. Now that that immediate crisis is over, the pandemic and, and the issues, is they're certainly not behind us, but things have, I think we can safely say for now, have somewhat leveled off and we can now take, catch our breath and say, okay, what's sustainable? And so I know with our program, we're having some conversations about what is sustainable. Um, we're looking to move from, you know, the telehealth uh, component, our students had to apply and do the training to do it at that point. And we had to do it within two weeks, right? Many of our, many of the programs did. Now we're talking about integrating that as more of a, a staple into our general curriculum. And we're going to look at requiring the telehealth component for all students, because at this point, it's not just, you know, being telemental health trained isn't just about being, um, uh, uh, what's the word, a highly specialized corner and um, being competitive, I think it's about remaining relevant at this point is having that under your belt. Um, so we're looking for ways to integrate that into the curriculum and as a requirement for students who enter our field experience at this point. I chuckled, Heather, when you showed us your slinky and talked about your oil um, diffuser as I sat here with my little weird squishy ball in hand yeah. at a standing desk with my own oil diffuser going right next to me and was wondering how many people are doing similar weird things and now have toy boxes next to their computer. But um, I'd love to hear also from Karen about um, what uh, your thoughts are about some of the strategies to navigate some of these challenges. Hello again, um, and I have silly putty um, because I'm a fidgeter. Um, when I looked at this talking point, it kind of um, made me think how the challenges that, that came up kind of almost out of the blue and we had to really um, make that adjustment fast, it's actually become a really good opportunity um, again, I work with practicum students and um, like um, Heather was saying, you know, now telehealth has kind of be become a norm. And so our students really need that experience. And so this is an opportunity for them to get some training and experience with that supervision um, right there um, and built into to their experience. Um, we pivoted um, because we were working with practicum students um, who didn't have a lot of experience. We pulled in volunteers from our undergrad programs. And at times I'll have 30 to 40 volunteers who are willing to, to be the client. And that's worked out really well because 
then we're not risking a client who's in crisis as much with somebody who's really um, inexperienced and those types of things. And what we found is that our students, we, we deal with things like, you know, what do you do with internet security and contact information because they're using their university email and you're not worrying about, you know, your online safety of your students as much and your systems. So it's become a really good opportunity. Our undergrad students get to experience counseling because many of them haven't experienced it, or if they're looking to go into the field, they get that experience. Our practicum students get the experience of working online and aren't stumbling as much with clients who are coming in with a critical problem right away. So they're able to kind of get their practice in. They know their client's gonna stick around for five to seven sessions. So they're not, they're not having to deal with, oh my gosh, is my client gonna like me? Is my client gonna stick around? What do I have to do? And all of those things. So it created a really nice experience for our practicum students to get that initial experience. Um, and then when they move into internship, they can do telehealth if they need to with uh, maybe a more um, vulnerable population or um, they already have that experience, they have that training or when they go into that experience or their um, experience, postgraduate experience in person, they've got some of those skills already anyway. So it's actually become a real opportunity that we will probably continue once we could go back into in-person work. Um, so I think that creativity has been, um, has actually uh, created a really good opportunity. What an innovative idea with undergraduate volunteers. That, uh, that thought would have never occurred to me. Um, okay, I think we're ready to, to transition then into our third talking point. Based on these new realities and in consideration of issues related to distance learning, legal and ethical concerns, skill development and general knowledge, what do graduate students need to know before they enter into their internships? And what should their programs be doing to ensure that they're prepared? And what should clinical sites be doing to support mentor interns and new professionals? For the clinical site portion, maybe we could kick things off with uh, you, Christy. What are your thoughts about this question? There's a lot of things. Um, and I think some people have talked, one, one of the presenters was talking about um, making sure that they're aware of the risks that are associated with the site. You know, we do have a, a COVID uh, a liability, a removal liability thing that's in place, but to talk a little bit uh, about some of those risks and the legal and ethical uh, risks, you know, when you have somebody who is one of those put their head down and just work through it, that sometimes this is not necessarily the best time to do it. Sick time is good. Um, so we want to prepare our students about the, the very real, the, the risks that are going, and, and things are changing so fast on a, on a statewide level in my state, as well as a, a national level, where we're seeing things that we've not been allowed to do before, like be able to do telehealth across state lines. Um, that's something that's very new, and we're all just sort of watching this. So it is, working with graduate students on this, this field that right now is on the cusp of so many changes in different ways that we implement service and to assess those things to assure that if there are good things for this for us or not um, as we've lapsed in, in some ways we've lapsed a little bit of standards that have got me a little bit concerned um, and so I think that the the programs have to be adept with all of these changes that are coming on that are affecting placements and affecting services that they're able to do. The other thing is really interesting being in a, in a, in a private practice. We're, we're not a state agency, we are a private practice, so we don't have all that nice limited unlimited state funds that sometimes people go if they go to a state mental health center. So I spend a lot of my time working with interns to explain the difference 
between like my state, South Carolina and North Carolina, which has a completely different mental health system than Tennessee. And so we're trying to explain all of those and navigating insurances. You know, we didn't exactly take a billing course in your graduate program of how to be able to not only do effective service, but how to get paid for it. So those are things that, that we that we work a lot with interns on. I'm not sure if that's an answer to the question, that, but that's something that I, I guess I view, by the time they come to us, they have all the theory and they have all of the background in that, and now we have to fine tune that theory and we have to put it into practice. And students who are coming in have to be open to the fact that, you know, I have people, for example, that come in and say, I only wanna work with children, I only wanna work with children. And then they work with a couple of my children that I work with, and then they go, I'm not sure I wanna work with children. And I'm saying, you've got to be open because there are, I've been doing this over 30 years. I am not working with populations I ever thought I would work with in graduate school. And so you have to be open to always be flexible and to learn and to, especially when you're in a rural practice, um, that's another thing that I sometimes find when people come out of, um, out of programs, they come in and they have this idea of what, you know, this is what my practice is going to be and I'm going to do this. And you have to be open to the community that you're serving. You know, people ask me all the time, what is your specialty area? And I said, whatever walks through the door that can pay me, you know, you have to be very realistic with them as far as going forward and to understand things because they don't understand how insurance reimbursement works and how clawbacks work and all of these other professional things that will sometimes undermine them as they're going forward and writing notes and all of the technical part. I do wish school spent more time on that as well because I have the last three interns that we had, their note writing, I, I felt like I was more of an English teacher than a, than a therapist supervisor sometimes. Hmm. Cannot tell you how many, you know, for our state chapter of AMCA, how many questions we get from our members about billing for telehealth and about what happens if my clients across state lines. I'm glad that you've highlighted issues like that. Uh, I also was thinking about when you were talking about, you know, how geography is sort of a, a variable here in ways that it never was before. I was thinking about a client I was doing some couples work with. Uh, him and his wife, and he was looking for an individual therapist who was certified in cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI, and saying there are no CBTI providers in the entire greater Tampa Bay area who are on my insurance network. And I said, you know, good news, since 95% of therapists in Florida are doing telehealth now, you could expand your search to any licensed counselor in the state. And he was able to link to an appropriate specialist that way through telehealth. So, so it really mm -hmm. has become a game changer. I'd love for us to maybe hear um, what some of your thoughts are about this question, Heather. Sure. Um, I, I think going back to one of my previous um, points that transitioning from face-to-face -to, -face to telehealth for students and programs alike. It's just, it's not a simple process. We all, we all learned that, right? We all <laughs> discovered that a year ago. It's not, not something to be taken lightly. And to to expand a bit on what Christie's already mentioned, um, you know, there's, there's still, while there's some latitude that's been extended, we're still in this period of kind of amnesty, temporary um, latitude that does have an expiration date. So at least for our training program, we've not extended those latitudes to our trainees and we remind them because oftentimes I'll have students say, well, I, from what I understand or what I heard, I can do anything that you know, is it, HIPAA doesn't matter right now, and and they're misinterpreting um, the 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 different um, grace periods and latitude that's been extended. It's not it's not that HIPAA doesn't matter, and and it's not that um, it's not that uh, at the same time, if you're operating with your due diligence, you know, that's one thing, but but national or state level leniencies are never going to release you from your ethical 
obligations to your clients. So we really remind students that and we look at the um, extensions of grace and latitude and reserve those for seasoned, fully licensed, able to practice independently clinicians. Um, so we, we out the gate, let students know we're not crossing state lines. We are not there yet. Um, this is still a training program. So to really have an appreciation for the differences and how to interpret um, the latitude, you know, while um, penalties for HIPAA violations um, might be uh, might look different right now. That doesn't that doesn't mean that we're encouraging our students to get on FaceTime or Skype or or other and 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 not to. I mean, I, I love those platforms for many reasons, but they're not everything is HIPAA compliant or appropriate. So just really emphasizing um, for students and programs alike the importance of understanding their state laws, uh, ACA code of ethics. Uh, the importance of safety protocols, uh, especially those of us in the digital space where we have students that um, span the nation or, or span the globe, really, we have an international reach um, and having a really good understanding of your state or your region's guidelines is, is, um, is a mission critical um, area. Rules and regulations change often. Sometimes you can call the same state board um, and they don't always know their own regulations or it depends who you talk to, right? And and they certainly don't always do um, uh, the most uh, efficient of jobs when it comes to communicating when, when a change occurs. So some states right now have laws and rules pertaining to telehealth, while others do not. And so to keep track of that is just a, a, a monumental task. So not we, we try to do our own due, due diligence and um, educate ourselves and keep abreast of that. But we also partner with our students and put the onus on them in part as well. I think it's really important to um, get them acclimated and oriented and I guess demystifying that idea of calling their state board. It's daunting, sometimes frustrating. Um, people are short staffed right now and it's hard to get a live person on the other line. But um, part of the part of I think of us being responsible to our students is to help them um, orient themselves and learn what the rules and laws are in, in the state where they live. Um, all that to say, I, I think it's really important to have that appreciation for um, everything that goes in line and that a lot of what's happening right now with our circumstances and latitude and leniency is temporary. My hope for the future is that there'll be more parity um, and perhaps reciprocity and, and best practices and, and more, of an, more of an authority over where to go for best practice. Of course, we do have the board certified telemental health credential, um, you know, but, but having more of a collective understanding of, of what's best practice and um, no matter what, that we're not released from the expectations of our ethical codes. I think if we're intentional around that, as well as our accreditation standards, and we build that into the curriculum, um, that's really important. We, as a program right now, are, are having, we're forced to have that really tough discussion about what does quality training mean? Like for students who are entering practicum now, their only choice may be providing telemental health. They're saying, I can't find a site in my community. Well, the responsibility is on us in part to help our students to offer more services and resources to help them secure sites. But also if they land themselves in a telemental health only, okay, what can we do to bolster that other part of training that's integral is that face-to-face -face piece. I love the idea of having, you know, the undergrad students or other people at the university offer to serve as clients um, and, and practice that way. But I think there's got to be some balance. Uh, this is a whole brand new way of, of training our clinicians. And um, there's some creative tension about around, you know, what's quality training? It, does it really look entirely in the digital space? Can we still have both? Heather, it's very refreshing to me that you bring up that the temporary exception on not enforcing 
HIPAA is uh, under good faith pinch hitting provisions is very different than willfully and regulate regularly violating HIPAA and both not only from a legal perspective but also an ethical perspective and a civil malpractice perspective I guess I could add to that so thank you for bringing that up would love to hear from you Karen about some of your thoughts about um, some strategies yeah and I too am really glad that you brought up the the piece around the exceptions that were allowed for the, the kind of quick nature that everybody had to pivot to telemental health and to other realities. Had a couple of students who are like, yeah, it doesn't matter anymore. We can do this. We can do whatever. And um, I think as we go forward, we have to really think about making sure that our students are trained in telemental health since that is a reality now. And we need to make sure that we're really discussing the ethics and the practicalities of that and how telemental health isn't everything and in-person isn't everything. It's a combination. And we have to, we have to look at each, each as a modality. Telemental health is a modality and it used to be reserved for the most seasoned professionals who could moderate that. Well, now our students are having to do that from the get-go. So making sure that we're training them um, in that as a modality and we're looking at what are the liability pieces? What are the ethical pieces? Um, what about licensure? And both um, Christy and Heather brought up the, the piece around, okay, what about going across state lines? What about you know when your client moves because they're no longer need to be in the state to go to school or they no longer need to be here or there? Um, or, but also on the other hand, you can find more people, um, to work with. You don't have to worry about, are they in my community? Maybe they are 20 miles away and, and I can get there on my lunch hour because I'm doing telemental health. So it's kind of the, both those things you, we need to, to learn about distance learning as a modality. I think also one of the things that this has brought up is the importance of making sure students know how to ask for help and that they know how to ask for supervision. And when you're in an online format, you have to, it, it's a little bit different in how you have to ask for supervision. And when you're going to a clinical site, how do you ask for supervision if you're doing telehealth or if you're in person? And Again, like somebody said, if you're masked up or you're in full, um, you know, hazmat suits, what, what does that do to your supervision? What does that do to your clinical work? And how do you mentor interns to navigate that stuff? So I think it's really about, um, you know, having those multiple touch points. If you're doing supervision online and you're, maybe you need to have more than just one point of contact that their student can get to. Um, maybe um, we have to teach them how to reach out. Maybe, you know, all kinds of different things. What, what ways are they communicating? Is it, you know, are they using encrypted email? Are they um, using video chat? Are they just using the phone? How do they contact people? So kind of expanding our view of what we need to um, help the students know about supervision. How do they approach that? All right, thank you, Karen. And speaking of which, I'm wondering if there's anything you'd like to add with this question, Cassinia, from the perspective of a student intern. Uh, yes, I would like to add and, uh, and say that um, in my program in South and New Hampshire University, we've learned a lot about legal uh, and ethical considerations regarding the population that we were going to work with. So it's really important. And I do recommend uh, for every student to know the requirements of their own state. And uh, we also were required to take uh, this telehealth learning to get the certification before we start any practicum or uh, internship right now, because a lot of services provided through telehealth so just knowing a lot of ethical um, concerns, like knowing where your client is located. Um, so knowing this, that you're like uh, obligated to know what place uh, client um, resides so that um, 
what ethical and legal uh, considerations you have to take. Um, and I also would like to share and say uh, for the clients, that, oh, sorry, for the students, that I do recommend to make as many hours during a week as they can, because uh, the requirements uh, were different bef before pandemic, but right now, not knowing where your site can be closed and how many clients uh, you will have in future, I do recommend to have as many clients uh, weekly or just, I was lucky enough uh, to have almost all my hours done within the first week of uh, practicum when I found out that uh, the, the site is, is going to be closed and there will be no opportunity for uh, students to continue practicum there. And I had only eight hours left and my supervisor allowed me to finish it. So that's why I, I, I just recommend for the students to be uh, more proactive and to take all opportunities they can during this time. Mm, sounds like the, you're sharing the perspective that, you know, get the hours when you can, because you never know what tomorrow is going to bring. Ab absolutely, absolutely. And the last thing I would like to share, I don't want to take a lot of time, uh, that uh, during the quarantine time, I didn't lose this uh, um, like my time and I took some uh, online education and I, uh, I've learned uh, emotional freedom technique practice, which I was uh, allowed to, to use at my site when, when I had my internship. And uh, that was another opportunity for me when I didn't have my own clients and uh, the caseload. So I was able to see clients of other therapists and provide some services to them. So that's uh, how I became like trauma-oriented trauma uh, intern in my site. So that gave me some other opportunity to get my hours and uh, have experience at my site. Okay, thank you for adding that. I think I will hand the virtual microphone back over to Amy here to transition us into our summary piece. Thank you, Erin, and thanks everybody for um, such informative um, perspectives on, on what's been happening. Um, I wanted to take just a few minutes to, to summarize some of the things I think that, that stood out for me um, and wanted to open this up. So if you have comments or questions that you wanna start putting in the chat, you're welcome. If you would rather wait and, and ask, um, physic, personally ask, ask out loud, um, however to phrase that, you know, you could raise your hands later. But I think what, what seems very clear is that telehealth is here to stay in some form or fashion, that, that you know, most entities are anticipating that some clients are gonna want telehealth, that telehealth allows for accessibility in a way that, especially in rural areas, more remote areas, um, people might be able to access services or find somebody with a specialization perhaps um, across the state. So it, it feels like this, this idea of partnerships between, you know, the sites and the universities has always been important, but there's, there's maybe a different emphasis now where we need to make sure we're brainstorming together, right? That, that the university faculty understand what is happening at the sites um, so that they can proactively, you know, share information with students. I mean, the, the importance of the ethical and the legal, and I also very much appreciate uh, the commentary regarding, you know, just because we've been given some grace doesn't mean that we take the easy way out. And I think, you know, especially when we're, we're overwhelmed ourselves, like that can be a fallback of like, oh, I have no energy to do what I know I need to do. And I think what better time to emphasize, you know, when students are in training that, did I freeze up, that that is, that's not acceptable. And so, um, again, just such an important message that we can convey and, and try to model as well through offering opportunities for trainings, through having rigor in what we expect, um, you know, to the degree that that's possible. Um, the other piece I think of, um, forget who said um, something that made me think of this, but it was like those the teachable moments, right? If you're a, a clinical supervisor, if you're on site, you know, take those opportunities to when something happens or you have to pivot a certain way, even if you're virtual, you know, making that moment to talk to the students, to talk to your interns about, this is why I did what I did, or this is how we navigate this situation. Um, you know, all of those things that they're gonna encounter, the more you can do that in the moment with them. And again, I realize it's difficult when you're not in the same space, um, but proactively recognizing the importance of, oh, well, they might encounter this on their own. And the more I can give them some context or some background or talk through with them and help them navigate maybe the ethical dilemma that they might be experiencing, that that can be really important as well. Um, 
But I mean, I think I could go on and on. You know, you all made such important points. I don't want to just regurgitate them. Um, but anyway, so Aaron, I don't know if there's anything else you want to highlight before we turn to some questions or some open discussion. Uh, I suppose something I'd like to say is um, one message I was kind of getting from from each of you as I was listening was maybe kind of a realization or at the very least a desire for us to sort of transition from we're scrambling in desperation, clinging desperately for some, some sense of what to do next with this situation to, okay, we've got a little bit of breathing space now. A new normal has sort of set in. Maybe now we can think more constructively about how we can improve the quality of what we're doing under these circumstances and maybe even get a little bit creative and use really sharpen our clinical skills as well as our ethical and uh, legal um, practice in what we're doing that maybe now's a great time to be tightening up the ship so to speak and and also branching into some new uh, some new and creative and innovative approaches that seem reasonable given the circumstances and uh, and less of a desperate sense of a desperation. Um, I do think, you know, historically in our profession, in the counseling profession, every time that there's been a national crisis or a disaster, it has precipitated a period of significant growth within our profession um, because we've always risen to the occasion after such crises and, and awareness of mental health and its importance in terms of our uh, our health and wellness as a country just expands. So I'm hopeful that we can begin to take a somewhat more optimistic and hopeful approach. Um, and for those of you uh, who read Amka's The Advocate magazine, we will have an article coming out our next edition called Counseling During a Pandemic, where we, we talk a little bit about some of the unique tips and strategies that people are coming up with that they've learned from reflecting back on this experience thus far. So now I'm sure we'd love to hear from folks who maybe have some questions out there who are tuning in or um, some items in the chat box maybe that have been asked. I don't see anything in the chat box right now. I see nothing and I see no virtual hands. Maybe, maybe we were so thorough, our panelists were so thorough. Well, this is a great opportunity, everybody, to pick the brains of four wonderful panelists in very diverse settings and with diverse experiences to maybe find out what are some of the more about some of the tips and strategies that they're using. Um, we do have our first question that came in. Uh, is there a good resource for finding which states have regulations about across state lines work. I have a I have a, an answer for that, but I'd love to hear with the panelists if there's any a resource that you recommend. All right, nobody so far. There, that is a huge undertaking. So I'm I'm anxiously waiting what Aaron has to say. However, I am aware of with regard specifically to distance supervision, I know that there and it, oh, the website fails me, but I'll find it. But it's really, um, as far as I know, that's that's what we've been referring to as a program in terms of supervision that's done at a distance. I'll find it and maybe put it in the chat. And okay. I'll just jump in and I'm probably going to respond a lot like you, Erin. Maybe we'll see. Um, but right now, there isn't a lot of portability. And um, so most state, most state laws um, do not allow you to work across state lines. And, um, and they, they're kind of blurred about telehealth and there, I'm not sure that there are, is a real clear um, one-stop place to find all that information. But most, most state laws will talk about what they allow. Mm -hmm. We've, we've been recommending a sort of a three-step process. <laughs> First, find out, um, like, let's say that you're, you're practicing in Florida and you have a client in Georgia and you're trying to figure out, my client, they just shared with me that they're going to be in Georgia at, in some cabin when we do our next session. Am I allowed to do this? The first resource I suggest is to use the free Telemental Health Laws app 
which you can download regardless of whether you are using an iPhone or an Android based phone and can use. It's been a wonderful resource. What you do with it, you, you put in the state that your client's in and then you click on the licensure requirements and it'll tell you if there are any unique laws or rules in that. Oh, and you have to select your, your licensure um, category as well. So like counseling, for example, if you're a counselor, and then it will tell you what laws or rules exist in that state about providing telehealth to people who are physically in their boundaries. So that's step one. And I have just pasted a link into the chat box that you can use to access that app. The second resource is understand that what you won't see in that app is any temporary exceptions that have been made by various states because of the pandemic. Some states do have some exceptions in place. So there's a second resource that we like to suggest for that one. It is updated every single week and it's from the Federation of State Medical Boards. So understand some of it will not apply to counselors and others do, it really depends on what you're looking at. So you can look at the state that your client is in or will be in and see if there's a temporary exception in place. Usually there's not anymore in my experience. And most of the time the answer is no, you can't provide telehealth to somebody in our state unless you're licensed here. But sometimes that's not the case. And these two resources help you figure that out. The third step is when in doubt, contact the licensure board of that state. And especially if you try the other two resources and you just don't have a clear answer. Only problem is sometimes good luck getting a response and especially in a timely manner. But it is always, you know, you're, you're trying to do everything within your power to make sure that you're abiding by the law. Right. And can I just jump on all that? And, and this can change in a dime as it can lately with the federal government. When you're hearing about people crossing state lines now, it is because there was a a uh, federal mandate that allowed you to do that. But like everybody else has said here, if somebody does, it's always a good idea to get into the habit of contacting the other state um, because the federal mandate right now is still in place that you can do it, but that can be wiped out before you know it. So it's better to err on the side of caution when you're doing it. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to shift to, to another question just um, to keep us moving a little bit. Um, I think there was a, I'm not going to read it verbatim, but the idea of how, how are we helping um, prepare students for both face-to-face -face and telehealth? What are we doing in our classes or what could we be doing in our classes to prepare students? And I don't know if any of the panelists have thoughts about that um, that they'd like to share. I'll just jump in around not the classroom piece because I'm not in the classroom. But again, like I said, what we've learned is that by uh, having the students work in telehealth for practicum, they're getting that experience. And then when they transition to internship, as things start to open up, then they can have the in-person experience also. And by doing both, they're getting both experiences. Yeah, and I think you're, I mean, just thinking about that developmentally, right? I mean, to it kind of connect it to a lot of what y'all said, to throw a, an intern into working with a, a fairly significant case via telehealth for the first time when they're nervous about telehealth and they're nervous about the issue that they're addressing, if you can, you know, lessen the stress related to one aspect of that, yeah, that certainly can be helpful. What about the rest of you? Any, any thoughts or... Uh, can I jump in and share, uh, as I have my program online from the very beginning, so we had a lot of practices uh, uh, with, like, with mock clients working uh, um, online with each other, and so we have this practice, and we know how to do this through like telehealth, so maybe just thinking about it and incorporating and bringing it to some other programs which are in person at the very beginning, just so that uh, students are more comfortable uh, working like through uh, through the screen behind the screen and knowing how to uh, address and navigate uh, the session that that might be helpful for a lot of students. I think so too. Yeah, absolutely. Heather, you're a you're a counselor educator type. Any any thoughts on your end? Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> Not at all. I was actually just about to put something in the chat. Um, I think Karen's earlier point about telemental health being 
a modality and understanding that it's 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 yet another modality from which we do our work as people helpers and it's not for everyone so the idea if i think if we operate from this telemental health piece is um uh it's not re- it do- shouldn't replace what we do but rather reinforce in many ways and i think it's 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 a question of the hour that was asked like how do we do it i think um slowly but steadily integrating that into curriculum into training opportunities i think is doing right by our students but treating it as a modality not a replacement to that traditional face to face work yeah and just building off of what i think you had had talked about before was the idea that you know like with any training program you don't graduate from your counseling program completely prepared and ready to go and so you've been introduced to the idea of telehealth if you want to run with it this is what you need to do to continue to enhance and grow and develop the skill set that you know nobody's going to leave fully prepared and knowledgeable that ongoing professional development in whatever we're doing is pretty critical um other other thoughts about that question before we shift to whatever else we can get through? All right. Aaron, did you have one that you wanted to pull out while I was? Sure, I was just responding. Um, some There are some ideas and questions that people have been posting. Um, can AMCA do some advocacy example with ASCB to get a resource from state boards across um, about cross state lines work. And um, I, I just posted that, you know, we can certainly pass that suggestion along. At the very least, it'd be great if um, we had like a place on the website that was very easy to access that had all the, the links or could show you the steps to figure out, you know, what the law is in another state. And then um, we had another suggestion can we coin the term telecounseling? I think this gives our profession some ownership of what we're doing. And it is the term I've been using with clients and colleagues. I'm wondering, anybody have any thoughts about that on the panel? Telecounseling. Like it, don't like it. <laughs> no one jumping in, huh? Have to kind of sit with the idea for a while. Yeah. The one thumbs up from somebody. I don't, um, did you, Amy, I apologize because for a moment when I was responding to a, a chat message, did, did you already bring up the question about environmental security and privacy? I don't think so. Posted. No, we hadn't gotten to that one. Okay, that would probably be a good one for us to direct to the panel. The question is, how can you cope with environmental security and privacy, domestic violence or family not respecting autonomy and not the client, um, not able to confirm that they're in a secure location to communicate? Really important question. If nobody else is gonna jump in, that's one of the, um, the, the key reasons why um, we have to really pay attention to um, telehealth um, ethics and legal issues and, and experience because you have to know resources in the area where your client is. You have to be able to know your client well enough to know, okay, what am I experiencing here? How can I, do I turn, um, one of the things that I've, I've learned from some Title IX work that I've done is when they're doing a hearing, they turn or interviewing, they have people turn the camera on their computer to show where they are. Um, it's going to be a lot more difficult if you're dealing with it in a domestic violence situation or a um, similar type of situation if you've got somebody who has access to their computer. Do you make sure that you don't send resources? Are you encrypting your um, documents so only that person can get in, which doesn't matter if somebody else has their password. So you have to really kind of keep in mind what's going on there. And um, do you know your client well enough? Do you know the situation? And that's where your experience and intake comes into play. Anybody else have some thoughts to share about security and privacy um, in a telehealth environment? 
I think I would also say if this is something that you are interested in delving into, then you really want to spend some time looking at the technological requirements for it. It isn't, as somebody said earlier, it's not like you can go on Skype or Facebook Messenger and, and do it that way. And a lot of people really don't understand the technological requirements. It has been around a long time. It's not a new thing from COVID. And they have gotten better at being very specific about these are the things you need to ensure um, as much security as you possibly can have. It, um, you can take a class in telecounseling, telemental health counseling, whatever you want to call it. Um, you can take a class and get the technological requirements. There are CE requirements if you get your board certified telemental health provider. And so all of those things are, are things that we have to promote to students that this is just a specialty area, just like anything else. And if you're interested in doing it, then get the appropriate training to do it. Well, everyone, as, as we're nearing the top of the hour, and again, it's a Friday, I appreciate, you know, people like Karen who are on the West Coast who were up pretty early um, to join us and, and everybody else for, for hanging out uh, for the past hour and a half. Uh, thank you to the panelists very much for your time and um, experience that you were willing to share. Thanks to KCREP and AMCA again for, for sponsoring this panel presentation. Um, there were some good comments in the chat if, if uh, everybody was able to read those as we went along. But again, we are we have recorded this presentation. So again, if you want to disseminate it or feel the desire to watch it all over again, um, it will be posted sometime soon. But I have no doubt that there will continue to be ongoing discussions about um, this very issue at our conferences and in our professional worlds. So hopefully we will all just continue to share and brainstorm together. And I think if we can all view, you know, COVID as an opportunity, I think somebody said before, there's a lot that we can take from this and, and how creative we were able to navigate and, and what we can carry on forward to, to continue to enhance our work. I think that's, you know, at least for me, the way I can keep moving forward, you know, and not be frustrated by some of the challenges. So hopefully that's, that's true for you as well. Aaron, any last words from you? I just really want to thank the panelists for sharing their wisdom and their experience and their encouragement with us and all of you for attending and chiming in with your comments and your questions so that you're participating in that process of us sort of figuring some of these things out together as a profession. All right. Thank you, everybody. Happy weekend.